Welcome to Money Matters with Karen Ford, where you will learn methods and manners for increase to help you move from financial bondage to financial freedom. Hello, this is Karen Ford and welcome to Money Matters. Today I want to talk to you about last day's money. Everybody needs money and today we're in the last days and that's what we're going to talk about. In James chapter 5 verses 1 through 3, we read, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your gar garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Now this is not a very uh, influential scripture. None of us like reading this, but see when money is taken from them, they are going to be miserable. But what does God say? What does God say to us today? He's saying, I want to keep my word. God wants to keep his word. And one of the things that we need to understand is we need to understand the covenant that God has made with us. In Deuteronomy 8.18, he says, And you shall remember the Lord thy God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Why? To establish his covenant. See, it's God Almighty who gives us the power to get wealth. Now, I want to I want to go on a little bunny trail here. He didn't say, I have given you wealth. He has said, I have given you the power to get wealth. That power is supernatural power. And yes, working is part of God's plan. You may have an idea today to start a business or to expand your business or a way to create wealth. That's probably a God-given idea. You still do, need to do your research and, and, and uh, you know, check out with God and make sure that this is His will and how He wants you to do it. But He has given us the power to get wealth. You know, back in the day, and some people may still have this thought today, you know, keep you poor, keep you humble. Listen, I've met a lot of poor people that are prideful. <laughs> and I've met rich people who are very humble. So uh, humility uh, is, is an attitude of the heart, right? So we could have a lot of money and still walk in humility. Okay, that's a word for someone right there. God has given us the power to get wealth. If God didn't want us to have wealth, why does he give us the power to get wealth? He gave us the power to get wealth, therefore he wants us to have wealth. But what is the purpose? Why does he want us to have wealth? Well, he does want us to enjoy it, but it's also to establish his covenant in the earth today. Listen, if I only have enough money for me and my husband, or my husband and me, <laughs> it, you know, we're not going to be able to help very many people, if any at all. But God is a supernatural God. He wants, he's a God of abundance. He wants us to have abundance so that we can have influence in the earth today. Glory to God. And that that's part of his covenant. The, another part of the covenant that we can look at is in Deuteronomy 28 verses 11 to 13. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain in the land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them. See, God wants us to have that if we will heed his commandments. We talked last week about how God equates honor. God equates honor with obedience. When we obey his word, he sees us honoring him and there in turn will honor us. Well, this is no different. He's saying you'll be the head and not the tail. You'll be above only and not beneath if you heed the commandments. We can't really expect us to be the head and not the tail if we're robbing God. We can't expect to be above only and not beneath if we're cheating on our taxes. No, God wants us to obey the laws of the land. God wants us to obey his word. Therefore, when we do, that is when we're going to be the head and not the tail. That 
that is when we're going to be above only and not beneath. Glory to God. So God wants us, God wants to keep his word and he also wants to get money into the hands of the right people. If you are a God fearing person today and you are blood washed, you have committed your life to Jesus Christ then you are the right type of person that God wants to get money to. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the righteous. The righteous, those are the right people. God wants to get money into the hands of the right people, and that's the righteous. Psalm 105, verse 37, he also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble feeble among his tribes. God will bring you out of Egypt into a place of disparity, into a, a, from a place of destruction, from a place of famine, and he will bring you into the promised land where there is over and above, there's abundance because he is a God who does exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. That is our loving and living God today. Someone else said he wants to get money into the right hands is in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 25. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away, say that, more than they could carry away, and they were three days gathering up the spoil because there was so much. Listen, when we take over the enemy, God wants us to take the spoils and have over and above Love. It took them three days to gather all of it, and that is what God wants for us today. He also wants people who know the purpose of money. We need to know that there is a purpose for money, and we're going to look at that right now in 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Say that with me, all things to enjoy. One more time, all things to enjoy. See, God blesses us because he does want us to enjoy it. We're his children. When you buy gifts for your children, do you just want them to look at it and never do anything with that toy or that game or that bicycle, whatever it is that you've you're earned, you have worked and earned that money and bought them something that's going to bless them and you want them to enjoy it. Well, God is a loving heavenly father. He wants us to enjoy the fruit of our labor. We work hard. We work 40 plus hours a week. He doesn't want us to save all of it or to give all of it away. We have to have money to live upon, but he wants us to enjoy it. He wants us to enjoy the money that he has blessed us with. Make all, I heard someone say, make all you can, save all you can and give all you can. See, we can make the money and we can save the money and we can give it, but he also wants us to enjoy it as well. He wants us to distribute it. We're to be distributors in the earth today. In Acts 4, verses 31 through 35, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled, assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they all had things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles feet and they distributed it to each one, anyone who had need. Now listen, that's a picture of the church today. When we gather together, and if you don't have a local church, I want to encourage you to get into a local church where God wants you. The best place to find a local church to get plugged in is not the phone book, but on your knees. God, what church do you want me to avail myself to get plugged into? If you're not part of the church, God wants you to be a part of the church. Uh, amen. And so 
we can uh, uh, lend our gifts to them. They lend our gifts to us, one part of the body. Listen, I heard someone say, the fire, the heat, the fire for God is in the, is in the co connecting. You take a bunch of charcoal pieces with the fire, and if one charcoal rolls a, a, away from all of the other little pieces of charcoal, it's going to cool off real fast. One way to make sure your fire gets ignited and stays ignited is being connected to the rest of the body. And one great way to be connected to the rest of the body is through the local church. But see, they gave. In, we see here in Acts, they gave, and then they gave out. They distributed it to folks who had need. That's one great way is by giving into the local church. So he wants us to enjoy the money that we, that we make. He wants us to distribute it as well. How many people can we help? We can give money to the local church. We can give money to the local mission. We can serve our time at the local soup opera. We can help the single mom down the street who has some children and is working, who may be struggling. Those are the type of people that I want to help. I don't necessarily want to help those who are sitting at home who are able-bodied, able to work, but choose not to. Uh, you know, yeah, there may be a time or place for that, but I like helping people who are actually doing their part as well because work is part of the plan. So he wants us to enjoy it. He wants us to distribute it. He wants us to communicate it. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. See, Paul's heart was, listen, I'm not seeking the gift that you're going to give me, but I am seeking the fruit that's going to abound in your account because you're being in obedience and helping me out. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Aphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. See, as we communicate the money, as we communicate it, we're to enjoy it, we're to di distribute it, we're to communicate it, we're to help those around about us. And the promise is, is that God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And I want to point something out in this scripture. Don't put God in a box and think, well, how is he going to supply my needs when I only make this amount of money? How is he going to supply all my needs when they cut my hours at work? How is he going to supply all my needs when I didn't get that raise that I thought I was going to get? That is boxing God in. God is, God is beyond your job to get your needs met. God is beyond whether you get a raise or not. God is beyond whether your hours were cut or not. Not His word does not say, I will supply all your needs according to your paycheck. He didn't say, I will supply all your needs according to the economy. He didn't say, I will supply all your needs according to the stock market. No, God said, I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. Where are the riches? In the glory. Where's the glory in? his presence. We get in God's presence, we get in the glory, and that's where the riches are. See, it's important that we don't
don't box God in. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting this here. God is not letting me off this point right here. God is beyond your job. God is not limited to providing your needs according to your paycheck. Listen, there's been multiple times where people have handed me money with, with a great handshake and there's been a $50 bill or a $100 bill in that hand that they pass off to me. God is beyond our finite thinking. We cannot try to figure out how God is going to supply our needs and all we're looking at is the way that we make money. No, 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 and again, no. God is beyond your job. God is beyond your paycheck. God is beyond the economy. Listen, we live in this world, but we are not of this world. God may tell you today, invest in this particular stock, and maybe down the road it's going to hit big. We don't know, but be led by the Spirit of God and know that God is not to be put in a box. <laughs> he is beyond our thinking. Amen. And then there's a finance, a great harvest of souls. God also wants us to know that he wants to get money into our hands to enjoy it, to distribute it, to communicate it, and people that have been proven faithful. That is who God wants to put money in their hands. People who are faithful. Remember, we talked about this before. He who is faithful in little, God, they will be faithful in much. But if you're unfaithful in little, then you're going to be unfaithful in much. God wants to put hands in the people who are faithful. In Proverbs 16, verses 10 through 12, divination is on the lips of the king. His mouth must not transgress in judgment. Honest weights and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. It is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. See, God has just scales. God does not reward wickedness. God is going to put hands in the people who are faithful. In Proverbs 28, verses 20 and 22, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. We have to see where our eyes are focused. Is Are our eyes always on money and looking to money? We talked about the spirit of mammon. Listen, we can't have divided thinking here. We can't put our trust or our confidence in money. We have to put our trust and confidence in the living God who will make sure that he provides to us and for us. A faithful man will abound with blessings. Are you faithful? Are you faithful with tithing? Are you faithful with giving offerings? Are you faithful to the local church? Are you being faithful to your word? Are you being faithful to his word? Look, do a self-evaluation. Check yourself out and see, am I being faithful? Glory to God. God wants to raise up some money matters. He wants to raise up money masters who become money magnets and who will become money movers. See, if we can master our money instead of our money mastering us, then we're going to become a money magnet where money is just going to flow into our hands from various places and people. But first of all, we have to know that we, money, that we master money rather than our money mastering us. How do we know if we're mastering money? Do you budget or do you just wing it every time you get paid? Do you have a plan for your money? See, the Word of God says, know the state of your flocks. Your flocks are your checking account, your savings account, your investments. You need to know the state of those things, right? We have to have a budget, and budget is not a four-letter word. When we get paid, are we living beyond our means? Those are some practical ways to see, am I mastering money? Or is money mastering me? Another way to know if you're mastering money, if God instructs you to sow an offering or give money to a particular place or person, are we? 
Are we walking in obedience to that? Because if we're disobeying an instruction from the Lord, then money is mastering us. I'm sorry to say that. But if God has instructed us to tithe, which he has in Malachi, he's telling us to tithe, otherwise we're robbing him, then money is mastering us if we're not doing that. We have to be money masters. Are we tithing? Are we budgeting? Or are we living beyond our means? If God instructs us to sow an offering and we just can't bring ourselves to it, at that moment, money is mastering us instead of us mastering money. There are certain ways that we can look at that and know if we're mastering money or if money is mastering us. Once we know and we're able to be a money master, then we will become a money magnet where money, we're just magnets. Money's coming to us in various places, uh, positions, and people and then we will become money movers. And increase comes with each and every one of those. People who have spiritual qualities, calling and construction of Joseph. That's who God wants to put money in the hands of. Let's look at the life of Joseph. He had consistency. Psalm 105 verse 19, it says, Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Joseph was, you know, his brothers betrayed him. They were jealous of him. They threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. But then one of the brothers, Reuben, said, Look, let's, let's at least sell him. All right. But the word of God tested him right? The Word of God. God gave him dreams. He saw that. He saw what was supposed to happen. But until, until that Word came to pass, that Word tested him. But he was consistent in what he believed. He was consistent with what God had promised him. There was chastity. In Genesis 39, verses 7 through 9, it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused. And he said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. How can I then do this great wickedness and sin against God? And he ran out of the room. And then of course, Potiphar's wife lied and said that he tried to rape her, but he stayed consistent and he had chastity. He was not going to engage in that. Another thing that he was is he had a, he was credibility. There was, he was credible in Genesis 39 verses five and six. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had expect for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, but he remained credible. He had character. He had honor. See, God took a situation where God had given Joseph dream, gave him that dream, and then there, all of these other things happened. He was thrown into a pit. He was sold. He was lied on right? He, the Potiphar's wife tried to trick him and, and he wasn't, he wasn't going to be a part of it. He kept a credible witness. And then there was clarity. Genesis 45 verses 5 through 8. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. He's talking to his brothers. There was a great famine and the brothers came and they didn't recognize him. And he said, look, I'm, I'm not going to kill you. I love you. And I know what you did to me was wrong, but God turned something around and made it for good. Maybe you've been betrayed in your life. Maybe you've been lied on and God has given you that dream. He's given you that vision of what he has for your life. May I encourage you today, remain credible. Stay, stay focused with clarity. Keep your witness. Keep your witness. Stay consistent. 
and chastity. Those are the keys that we can see in Joseph's life today. God wants to get money in your hands. He wants to get hand, money into the hands of the right people. Today there are end time Josephs in Acts 7 verses 9 through 11. And the patriarchs becoming envious sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles. God is delivering you out today out of all your troubles. And he gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt, second in command and in his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. Today, God wants us to have to be in time Joseph's, where we're where we have wisdom, where God is placing great ideas, where during the time where there was great abundance, they were able to store things up so that when people were in need, Joseph had it all stockpiled and was able to help them. Listen, he took a, God took a situation. He delivered Joseph so that Joseph could deliver a nation. Well, that's a word right there. God wants us to be Josephs in these end times. God wants us to be deliverers in, the, in these end times where we're able to help people walk out in, uh, out of famine into uh, abundance. That's a word for someone today. I want to pray with you. Father God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord God, that in these end times, Lord, you want to be true to your word. You want to put money into the hands of the right people. You want us to enjoy it. You want us to distribute it. You want us to communicate it, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that as we put our trust in you, Lord God, and we're faithful to obey your word. We're bringing you honor. And as a result, you're going to bring honor to us. We're not going to look to our sources here in the earth or in the world today, Lord God. We're going to look to you as our king, as our source. And you will use these other methods as resources to get money into our hands today. We thank you and we praise you. I release that wealth building anointing right now. Put your hand on the computer. Put your hand on the screen. I release that wealth building anointing on you today in Jesus name. Money matters and I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about Karen or to get a copy of one of her books, make sure to visit her on the web at karenford.org. Join us next week for Money Matters with Karen Ford.